But we'll hear more about that later, because Wrath of the Wild must come first. Are runners ready? Shall we breathe the wild? Yes. Let's do it. Woot woot. All right. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Newborn Insulted, and I'm here with TT and Environat and um, Tapir and Orcris lurking in the background as well. We're going to count these runners in, and uh, then we'll get about explaining how this is going to work and some of the cool things about Breath of the Wild. So um, I'm assuming both of our runners are ready. So I'm going to count down from three, two, one, go. All right. We are off here. We have about uh, a minute plus of a, of a super fun opening cutscene that um, all of us Breath of the Wild folks have watched hundreds, if not thousands of times, probably over the course of playing and running this game. Um, any of my uh, fellow runners and co-commentators want to say hello and introduce themselves real quick before we start explaining some of the features of this game? Uh, sure. I can go. Oh, sorry. No nope, um, problem. Okay, yeah, so I'm the first to start out here. My name's Environat, or Nat. Um, I do a lot of Zelda content. I've loved to play through, do a lot of first playthroughs of a series, and also other Zelda content and environmental-related stuff. Haha, <laughs> the pun with the username. Uh, but I also do some speedrunning on the side, so yeah. And my name is TT. Um, I have been a Breath of the Wild speedrunner for I don't know how long now. Um, but I am uh, the second one of this relay race, and I'm really excited to watch this. Uh, it's, this is going to be really fun. It is going to be a ton of fun. And um, so Environat and TT are both running any percent or, or kind of variations of any percent. And then the third leg of that any percent relay will be run by Senor Tapir. He'll be our, our, uh, our finale. He gets the luxury of, um, since the incentive uh, was met, he gets to take a quick detour on his any percent run to grab the Hylian shield before uh, heading into the boss rush. So that'll be fun. We'll talk more about that when the time gets there. And then against them on the other side, we have Orcrist GC, um, who is running an all dungeons run. And so the goal is or kind of the race is to see whether Orcrist and his all dungeons can be faster than the three back-to-back -back any percenters um, as they go here. Should be pretty tight, I think. So let's actually talk about this very first trick going on right here. So probably the most frustrating and inconsistent trick in the entire run is the very first one that we do. It is called the Shrine of Resurrection clip, where we get Link into the corner of the Shrine of Resurrection, um, run him into the corner, and then we spam the scope, the Sheikah scope, and it'll eventually push uh, Link through the wall if you have the correct angle. Um, when you get to the higher levels of any percent, uh, mess missing this on like the first couple seconds is, is a pretty much a reset, um, but it is, it's just a very frustrating uh, trick, and unfortunately we see Orcus is having a bit of trouble with it right at the moment. Yeah, both Link's facing angle and the camera angle are are fairly precise and finicky. And um, I'm sure you've experienced TT where you feel like you've got it lined up perfectly and for some reason it just does not push Link through. And it can be definitely a struggle sometimes. There he goes. He's on through there. Yeah, Shrine of Resurrection setups uh, expire, uh, I think, monthly. Absolutely. It's one of those where you've got to go and kind of grind an hour or two practice session just to make sure you've got it dialed back in. Which is not the most fun thing in the world. Um, this run, and especially even here in the the opening Great Plateau section, um, we're going to see pretty much all of the major movement glitches that we're going to be exploiting throughout the game. And um, so, one thing that you're going to see from Environat here in just a second is as she shield surfs down this slope, she's going to jump up and climb on this wall here, and um, shield surf onto a sloped part of the wall. Um, which is something that we call setting skew or setting a skew angle. And that allows us to do shield clipping as she's going to um, jump against the wall or actually shield surf against the wall and unequip her shield and just phase directly through the wall to get inside Temple of Time without going through a, a normal entrance. We'll see Orcrist here do the exact same thing shortly. And then right into the next part of uh, the movement tech that you'll see a lot of during this uh, called BLSS, where she is going to pull out her shield and her bow at the same time. Uh, yeah, pull out her shield, grab her bow and the pot at the same time, and then jump onto this 
surface, and then you'll see her start wiggling. And this is called a BLSS, or Bow Lift Smuggle Slide. It is the fastest way to move in Breath of the Wild. Oh no, she unfortunately dropped the pot there. Um, it is the fastest way to move. Uh, we wiggle because uh, the item that Link is holding is essentially pushing him in the opposite direction. So if you wiggle, it just gives him more and more momentum. Um, so she'll be sliding over to the first shrine, which is the bomb shrine. Yeah, BLSS um, is about a, well, at this point, what, about a two-year-old trick, I think, we discovered in 2021, and it really revolutionized most of the mainboard categories in Breath of the Wild because it's so fast, it doesn't require stamina usage, it doesn't um, deplete your health at all like some of the other movement techniques do, and so um, it is super, super advantageous uh, in terms of getting from point A to point B very efficiently. Which is part of the reason why we actually go to the Bomb Shrine first now. Um, you can activate BLSS with any object that you can pick up, uh, including bombs. And so the fact that, you know, we can have bombs all the time, and then you just have to find a surface that Link will step up onto. Um, it's uh, specifically the step up animation um, that puts him into the, the slide. Um, and so then we can just BLSS wherever we want. Um, AD Angry Demon Noises in the chat did point out that uh, it has made the runs a lot more accessible. It's a lot more consistent, a lot more, uh, it's not as punishing as the older routes have been. Absolutely. And we're about to see the other reason why we go to bombs and get the bombs rune first, um, as Environat and then Orcrist after her are going to do um, kind of one of the mainstays of Breath of the Wild movement exploits called Wind Bombs, um, in which. The runner jumps forward off a, off a ledge, um, places a bomb behind them, enters bullet time, places the second bomb, and then explodes the first bomb to propel the second bomb into Link and send him flying forward at high speeds. Um, it happened pretty quickly there, uh, but you'll see a lot of those throughout this run, especially in Orcris All Dungeons run. We'll see a lot of wind bombs so you'll get your chance to admire them in all of their various forms and and uh versions and just fun fact about wind bombs uh it's actually a bomberman reference is that right i didn't know that actually yep there is an item in super bomberman called a wind bomb and it pushes you across gaps uh sadugashi the person who um, discovered wind bombs and helped optimize them and everything uh, is a major major fan of the Bomberman series so uh, he paid a little homage to it naming it uh, the wind bomb it's a fantastic bit of trivia it's a cool I still remember the day like waking up and um, learning about wind bombs I think it was September 8th of whatever year it was and yeah uh, wind bombs they, they fundamentally changed everything <laughs> Um, so they were they were a very uh, very big discovery for the community. Um, right now, it is time for mashers. Uh, both runners are going to be mashing through some dialogue, uh, trying to use the optimal routing. Which actually, we have routed the, the options. It's two option two, option one, option one, option two. Um, it just cuts out as much dialogue as possible, and then they are going to climb a wall and uh, BLSS their way over to Magnesis. Yeah, one of the cool things, um, any percent has been a towerless run for a long time. Usually in a casual playthrough, you'd activate the tower in order to access the shrines and activate them as warp points. Um, any percent for, for a long, long time has not needed those. Um, but it's only been um, since BLSS was discovered, um, and possibly even later than that, that, any, or that AD All Dungeons has become a towerless run. Um, for a long time you would see runners get the tower either, um, uh, well, usually with this new plateau route, I say new, it's been in place for a couple of years now, but um, between the bombs and Magnesis Shrine, you'd see runners stop and get the tower and then have to do a tricky wind bomb off the tower to ma the Magnesis Shrine. Um, but with BLSS and with the other um, glitches that we have available to us, um, it's now fastest to not activate um, the Great Plateau Tower at all, even for a longer run like all dungeons, which is pretty cool in my opinion. Yeah, because uh, while fast travel is nice, it is actually slow. True. I think a warp takes somewhere around 25 to 30 seconds, uh, depending on loading variations and stuff like that. Yeah, that is one thing to point out. Um, 
Breath of the Wild has very weird loading. Uh, we still don't understand how it works. Um, but a good example of how we've kind of uh, messed with it, if you actually notice at the end of the shrine when they go to skip the cutscenes after they receive the spirit orb, uh, you'll see they actually wait a little bit, and they wait for a specific reason. Um, we need the text box uh, over the monk to disappear before we unload, uh, before we skip. Because if we don't, the game takes time to unload the text and then unload the monk. So we have to uh, skip it. So... Uh, because you will lose about, I think it's about 10 seconds if you skip too early. It's kind of a shocking amount of time, actually. Yeah, it's aggressive. Like, it, you you feel real bad. Also, that <laughs> guardian's name is Greg. Say hi to Greg. Hello, Greg. Greg I actually didn't usually... know that was Greg's name. <laughs> yep, I always Greg. thought Greg was a rupee. Nope, Greg is that, 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 um, that guardian specifically. Oh, well, hi, Greg. Greg is usually not too much of a problem, but he occasionally can uh, can be a little bit unkind to us. If you're wondering why, you might have noticed both Nat and Orchrist um, at the end of the shrine, just before activating the monk cage and getting the spirit orb, they both dropped a bomb and blew themselves up. And you might have wondered, why in the world are they doing that? It's, it's kind of a valid question. Um, one of the interesting side effects of shield clipping, um, or really of any time when they... Um, do a shield jump and unequip their shield is it gives Link this weird glitched state um, that we call ragdoll state. Um, and the essentially the effect of that is that the next time Link um, takes knockback damage or ragdoll damage, um, he doesn't ragdoll at all. And that is a problem for us because we want a wind bomb at this tree that we're approaching here um, to get up to the stasis shrine. So one of the ways that we can remove Ragdoll Glitch is by bombing Link in order to make him take that knockback damage. And it will allow this um, next Wind Bomb to work. Otherwise, it wouldn't work at all. I do also want to point out that uh, slide in particular, the slide from uh, Magnesis to this the Wind Bomb tree, is probably the most difficult one on the Great Plateau. Uh, you have to pretty much, you know, thread the needle getting through that... Um, that destructed, destroyed bridge, uh, and then also getting up a hill without it. Looks like Orcris uh, hit something and it canceled his slide, so he has to try and get going again. But um, Nat had a really clean uh, segment and is already in the stasis shrine. Yeah, she got perfect height on that wind bomb. Um, it's a very precise wind bomb to get way, way up um, to the cliff where the stasis shrine is, and she executed that perfectly. Thanks. Yep. And I actually golded my last segment, too. I don't Let's know what's go. happening. Ooh. I'm nice sure job. the rest of it will go south somewhere, but that's fine. <laughs> Gaming. We'll see where it goes. <laughs> I feel like if you can get a gold in an any percent attempt, like, like you're good to go. Like, even if the rest of the run goes crazy, you know, you can feel good about that gold. And... I do want to point out the intricacies of wind bombs a little bit more. Um, so if you notice, when the, if both of them did that wind bomb, they waited for their stamina wheel to deplete a quarter uh, before they detonated the round bomb. Um, the reason they do that is because if you wait a little bit, uh, if you wait that quarter, you will get a, what we call a max height wind bomb, uh, which is going to launch you as vertically as possible. Um, we also have other variations um, that can shoot you very fast forward uh, or downward even. Um, I'm pretty sure you'll be seeing also some mid-airs from uh, Orcrist after we get the power glider. Uh, so there's there's some really cool looking tricky ones that, uh, that we'll definitely be seeing. Orcrist will definitely be showcasing a greater variety of wind bomb types and tech. Um, from mid-airs, like TT was saying, to um, turn wind bombs which flatten Link's launch trajectory and give you more horizontal speed and less vertical height. Um, any percent does a lot fewer wind bombs overall, and so we'll see a little bit less of that from our 80% runners. There is a wind bomb that you'll likely see from some of our later percent or later any percent runners um, that will skip most of these um, stasis uh, little puzzles here, the stasis puzzles, um, both Orcris and Nat opting to do the slightly slower but much safer strat of running through the shrine. And the good old Swiffy jump. The good old Swiffy jump. Uh, yeah, the jumping past that boulder that's in the way, you're supposed to stasis it, but we've discovered that if you just 
jump to the side of it and do a shield, a delayed shield jump, uh, you can just skip past it entirely. Um, we call that the Swiffy jump because our beloved uh, Swiffy 22 in the Breath of the Wild community, um, anytime they were commentating the any percent tournament that we had and mentioned on how easy that trick was, a uh, runner would inevitably fail it. So it has been lovingly uh, nicknamed the Swiffy jump. Meanwhile, Nat has made her way across the um, icy cold region, heading up to the Cryonis Shrine. And um, one thing we haven't really mentioned a whole lot is that because we're not activating the tower, uh, we have to clip into all these shrines, um, clipping in through the, uh, typically through the side wall, and then again, clipping into the elevator. And um, this one is in particular can be a little bit nerve wracking because you've got cold damage timer ticking down on you. So you notice Nat um, had grabbed some extra backup food earlier and very cleanly executes that clip into Cryonis. Orcris, meanwhile, I'm assuming is going to be doing an extended shield clip here. Um, TT, you're probably, or I know you're much more familiar with ESCs than I am. Do you want to explain kind of how the different, or how ESCs are different from, from a standard shield clip? Yep. So uh, standard shield clips are actually fairly simple. You just need to shield jump at a wall at the right angle and unequip. Um, extended shield jumps uh, are a bit trickier. So when there are walls that are double layered, so a regular shield clip only works on a single layer wall. Um, for an extended shield clip for like the front door of shrines, which is actually two walls, uh, you need to do a shield clip, unequip the shield, and then on the second frame where Link snap backs from, snaps back from skew, you need to re-equip the shield and then essentially do the inputs for another shield clip. So you essentially do two shield clips in a row. Uh, it is frame perfect. It is very annoying to do. Um, the timing's not terrible once you get used to it, but uh, unfortunately, frame buffering is not super consistent in this game. Surprise, surprise. Uh, it buffers one to two frames every time, so it's not always uh, positive. But yeah, extended shield clips, great for getting through stuff that you're normally not supposed to get through with a regular shield clip. Uh, just, uh, again, it's frame perfect. And uh, great wind bombs from both of the runners. Um, it's, looking, it's looking real, real good right now. Uh, this is the last part of the Great Plateau uh, section, though. They will be now heading from uh, Cryonis over back to the Temple of Time. Yeah, and once they land at Temple of Time and get the paraglider, that's where we'll see the runners diverge. They've been running essentially the same plateau route, um, but Environat is going to go... I mean, given the nature of the Ender Percent run, is going to go do some resource collection at Castle. Um, whereas Orcrist is also going to head to Castle, but then detour very quickly away from it after grabbing a few key items and head off to Rito Village to begin the first uh, dungeon segment of, of the All Dungeons run. Um, and uh, so we'll see them go their separate ways there. This is probably a good time to mention that Nat is doing a, a kind of a modification of any percent. Um, we're, we're kind of jokingly calling it any-ish percent where um, she's going to uh, end her run at the conclusion of the Blight's boss rush um, and not face Calamity. Calamity is, is a super punishing um, fight. And uh, TT, I'm sure you can speak to that as an e experience and accomplished any percent runner. Um, but uh, Nat was gamely trying to learn the any full any percent speed run, and um, that calamity fight was just proving uh, extraordinarily difficult, as it does for most folks as they're learning. Um, so uh, she's going to be ending her run after the blights, um, and uh, we'll pass it off to TT at that point. Yeah, uh, chat, let's give it up for Nat. She literally learned this like a couple weeks ago. Absolutely. To to, uh, to do this marathon. So uh, <laughs> absolute gaming from Nat on this perspective. But yeah, so I, I will talk quickly about the boss rush because we'll see it in a little bit. Um, since in any percent we don't go and clear the divine beasts like Orcus will be doing, we actually have to fight all four blades um, before going into Calamity Ganon. And the unfortunate thing about this and the reason why Calamity Ganon is so punishing is because if you die at any point during that boss rush, you have to start over from the very first one. So um, Calamity is a is a is a very very annoying fight to learn in the speed run. Um, so uh, just being able to get the blights though is is uh, is is pretty awesome. So you see uh, Nad here scanning amiibos to gather some fish. Uh, we will need that for a attack up potion in order to do the boss rush after. Uh, she runs around castle and uh, steals a bunch of stuff. Yeah. 
I like to grab extra fish here since the learning process. Yeah, like like getting extra fish. But I also just want to say I just uh, PB plateau and it's my first sub 17. Let's so, go. Hell yeah. Pretty exciting there. Yay. GG's. Thank you. You have good amiibo luck there too with two porgies yeah. in, uh, yeah. what was that? You scanned two amiibo and got got the necessary fish there yeah. uh, without any sweat. So the kind of the funky it, amiibo is designed to reduce, well, at least originally it was designed to reduce some of the RNG elements. Um, and now it's just kind of flat out faster. Um, but you need a certain number of either mighty carp or mighty porgies um, to cook an attack up meal to expedite the boss rush. Um, and any percent runners can attest that sometimes you can scan three, four, five amiibo and just not get the fish that you need, which is super frustrating. But Nat was fortunate to get um, two mighty porgies, which are the most powerful attack up uh, fish ingredient. Oh, God. Um, not sure where I'm at. But... Okay, so. So right now, Nat, uh, both of them are actually at Hyrule Castle. Uh, Chris <laughs> just picking up a bow and some other stuff. But Nat is uh, trying to actually get through a gate that we're hoping that the game didn't load in yet. Um, if it's not loaded, she will just be able to run in directly to where she needs to go. Otherwise, she has to kind of go uh, run around. There is a backup strat to it. But uh, yeah, this this part um, gate is probably one of the most annoying things in the in the entire run. Um, you could do this section absolutely perfectly, get here super fast, and the gate could still load in. Um, we got a loaded gate, unfortunately. These guardians here make things awfully scary. Finding a little safe spot there to stay away from the Guardian lasers that you can see targeting her. Orcrist, meanwhile, um, while we were kind of focusing on Nat's BLSS to Castle, Orcrist also BLSS to Castle, but to a different spot. And you saw him do a weird thing where he was dropping some of his chilies and um, mushrooms and uh, picking up... Or he dropped them and then picked them back up again while he was picking up arrows and a... Um, uh, a royal bow. Um, the bow and arrows are going to come in useful later, obviously, for fighting bosses, but the cycling of materials um, that you saw him do is in preparation for a glitch he's going to undertake here in just a minute or two once he gets to Rito Village called IST, um, which we will do, do our best to give a simple, concise explanation of um, without getting too lost into the weeds, because it's another super powerful glitch that has revolutionized almost every category in Breath of the Wild speedrunning. Yeah, I have no idea how it works, to be honest with you. It's all I'll, uh, I'll wait till he gets to Rito and, and starts doing it, and then I'll try to give the the um, sp the Spark Notes version of it, I guess, because it's very technical and very complicated. Um, but for now, all we really need to know is that he's collecting a variety of materials that ultimately he can use as scrap to perform the glitch. The, the materials themselves, the chilies, the peppers, um, the mushrooms are not important. Um, he does need to have at least one fairy left over by the time he gets to Rito Village. Um, but the other things um, are just kind of fodder for the glitch itself. Checks out. And Nat right now is grabbing a... Uh, what is this? I forget what, I forget what fang that is. Or, or scale, whatever. It's, it's dragon part. Nadra fang, I think. Nadra fang. So she's grabbing a Nadra fang. Uh, that's going to give her a longer duration on her attack up. Uh, it'll give her a 13-minute attack up. Versus when we normally do amiibo, uh, usually we have... Three minute and fifty second, I think, is the standard uh, time for it. Uh, so having the the thirteen minute um, attack up does make things a lot easier, especially if you uh, mess up some of the strats in blights. Yeah, it helps sneak... with safety and consistency a lot. Yep, she's gonna sneak strike this Lizalfo, grab his stuff, and then go over the cooking pot, and then make her attack up food. So now that Orcrist has arrived at Rito Village, he's going to talk to a couple of NPCs to just progress the uh, the quest flags to be able to access the Divine Beast here shortly. But you're going to see him in just a moment go to a merchant and do what will appear to be a bunch of random dropping, picking up, selling, smuggling, things like that. Um, it all has a purpose. Um, IST is an uh, acronym for Inventory Slot Transfer. It's a glitch that was discovered almost exactly a year ago. It's basically an inventory duplication glitch. 
Um, and without getting too lost in the weeds, I'll simply kind of say that it exploits the way that Breath of the Wild tracks items in your inventory when you go between save files or reload certain saves. Um, so he's going to smuggle some items and stick them to his hand. He's going to sell things to a shopkeeper. And the ultimate outcome of all of this is that he's going to wind up with um, seven or eight rubies that he will sell for all of his rupee needs throughout the run. Um, he will get thousands of ancient arrows and hundreds of fairies that will essentially make him invulnerable um, through the rest of the run. It will also make the um, the bosses uh, almost trivial. Not not to minimize what Orcus is doing because there's still hard strats that he has to execute, but um, it, it will make the boss rush uh, or the boss the the blights very easy um, compared to having lesser resources. So it's a super powerful glitch. Um, don't worry too much about the random nature of what it looks like he's doing. It's just a way of getting lots and lots of resources for his, uh, the rest of his AD run. Yeah, this whole process is wizardry to me. It looks that way, and it takes, it, it took me a long time to kind of wrap my head around what was actually going on. Um, the nice thing about it is that it doesn't require a lot of difficult inputs. Um... It really is just about following the steps correctly. Um, and Orcrus there didn't like what he was seeing. The, the items that he has stuck to his hand are not supposed to really drop towards the floor at all. And he must have felt like his input was a bit mistimed. That shopkeeper talking prompt is is the one precise input that's really needed here. Um, and that looks much better, I think. You can see the fairy kind of hovering by Link's right hand. And he's going to sell the remaining items and um, through all this inventory manipulation is gonna, after a couple of saves and reloads, wind up with lots and lots of really cool stuff to make the rest of the run possible. Well, and that is making her way. She is done collecting items for the boss rush and she is heading up to Sanctum now with one last wind bomb to set up for one of my favorite tricks in any percent, uh, wind blight skip. So, uh, shortly after the discovery of wind bombs, we discovered... Actually, if it was before or after. Either way, I think it was before. Um, we discovered that the Blight intro cutscenes are actually not pre-rendered. They're done in-game engine, which means their hurt boxes or hit boxes are active. So what we do is we get into a very specific position, um, aim at a very specific spot, eat our food and then step forward into the cutscene. And what's gonna happen is that arrow is gonna get stuck perfectly in place and you'll see uh, wind blades start kind of shaking a lot. Um, that means they are getting shot in the head repeatedly during this entire cutscene. Um, you'll see their head start shaking about now. That looks good. And uh, yeah, we can kill wind blight in one arrow in the uh, shot. And that was a beautiful, beautiful wind blight skip there, Nat. Yeah, Nat putting uh, putting some pressure on Orcrist early by having a really clean um, leg of, of the relay so far. These um, these boss fights, uh, I'm sure TT can give much more detailed explanation um, on these, but uh, they're all super scripted. Um, we have weapon durability and attack damage routed out very, very precisely. Um, and the nice thing about them is there's not a whole lot of RNG involved. Obviously, enemies can move sometimes in unpredictable ways, um, but typically we can script out how these fights are supposed to go, and as long as the runner executes well, um, they're fairly predictable. And so we see um, Nat taking care of Water Blight Phase 1 very expediently, and then um, going to knock... Water Blight down with a couple of headshots and just kind of power through them here. And I do want to point out on Orker's side, now that he has completed IST and everything, he has a, a ton of fairies, so he does not have to worry about dying for the rest of the run. Um, he will be all set on that, so he will be completely ignoring any kind of uh, cold damage or damage from wind bombs. Um, it's a... Uh, it's one of the, the better things. Back in uh, back in the day before IST, we had to uh, very carefully, carefully, carefully route um, all of our food. We had to we had to cook at certain times, make sure we got food at certain times. It was quite a pain. So IST definitely made things Way. a lot easier. Oh no! Oh no! That's and unfortunate. That... I messed up the spin for the second one, so I was trying to improvise, but oh well. 
I'll see if my safety save actually put me outside of the sanctum or if it put me all the way back. Yeah, unfortunately, the um, the That's boss good. rush, again, is not very uh, forgiving. It looks like your save is good. Um, take a quick moment to talk about one-shot protection. There is a mechanic in Breath of the Wild only in regular mode. This does not apply in master mode. Um, there's a mechanic put in place where if you get hit from full health and it's a fatal hit, it won't kill you. It will put you at one quarter of a heart. That works for 99% of things. Um, unfortunately for us, in any percent, uh, that 1% of things that I, I tell you exclude that are all happening right here in this in this boss rush. Um, Fire Blight and Calamity Ganon can and will one-shot you if you get hit by any of their attacks directly. Uh, so the opening sequence for uh, Fire Blight is a little bit tight on timing because you have to make sure you stun him. Otherwise, what happened with that, he'll float away and then just smack you into oblivion. Meanwhile, we're seeing Orcris. I don't know if you caught that just a moment ago, but this is one of those really interesting mid-air wind bombs where... Um, he wants, he's, you know, in the air and he wants to get to the center of uh, Vometo, the Divine Beast, to be able to fire these really quick shots out. Um, but there's an updraft here, and so um, it makes the wind bomb timing super kind of finicky and precise um, as he tries to get all those inputs in as quickly as he can. He did an incredible job not only executing the wind bomb, but then one-shotting each of those cannons, which when you have ancient arrows, um, they, uh, they get destroyed by one ancient arrow shot. And we've got some pretty cool visual cues that allow you to make those shots relatively consistently um, when you start from the center of the Divine Beast there where he was. All right, we get to see Nat's rematch against Fire Blight. Hopefully it goes in her favor this time. I'm sure it will. There she goes. She got it. Very nice. Stress. Nice. <laughs> Good save. Good save there. <laughs> I was like, I'm just going to go for stunning him. So, yeah. Yeah, we spent after um, the reroute of any percent second half, the castle, we, uh, Limb Cube and a bunch of other runners at the time. Um, spent a good week or so rerouting the castle and we that means we had to come up with whole new weapon routings for uh blights and everything like that and it um like newborn was mentioning before like the weapon routing and everything is very precise uh we have just enough arrows to kill calamity uh we have just the right amount of weapons to kill calamity um so it's uh it's a it's a little unforgiving if you if you mess up this is definitely the probably the the biggest bar to entry into any percent is learning the boss rush yeah, definitely. That's what that's what deterred me from the category. <laughs> yeah, that's why I said never again. It, it can be it can be pretty rough and pretty uh, demotivating after a while. Uh, but Nat is here on her last section. She is uh, on Thunderblade, uh, who I know many uh, many a uh, casual player of Breath of the Wild hate uh, Thunderblade, but we're gonna make a uh, quick work of them. Don't forget to get ready, TT. I am I am ready to go, man. Let's go on it. I am I am pumped and ready. Orcrist here is working on uh, Va Meadow, which in my opinion is the coolest and most satisfying Divine Beast from a speedrun standpoint because we can do the entire thing without getting the dungeon map. All of the terminals are accessible with our speedrun strats without needing to do the mechanic of tilting the Divine Beast wings. And so he's using BLSSs and wind bombs and ESCs to get expediently from one terminal to the next. And All it's right. super, super I think fast. I got it. So. All right. Oh, no, no. I bit that. Oh no. Okay, done. <laughs> you got this. You got this. You got it. Good. Oh, there it is. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. And I'm off. Yay. GG's Nat. Good GG. job, it'll, Nat. From Thank a tech you. standpoint, it'll take just a quick moment to get switched over to uh, TTs. Oh, we've already got Boom. it. Okay. Our tech Boom. team is awesome. He is. They are on it. All right. Great job, Nat. And GG on your your great plateau BB there. Thank you. Indeed. Yeah, I'll take one reset for Blights. That's fine. <laughs> yeah. And Fire what? Blight. Yeah, that's the one who loves to give me trouble mostly. So, yeah. Yeah, he's kind All of right. a jerk. Yeah. 
This would probably be Pippi. If we have any donations, now would probably be a good time while while TT's um, opening cutscene is loading here. Y'all read my mind. I was just going to ask because we do <laughs> have donations. Thank you, everyone, so much for donating to Planned Parenthood Federation of America and helping us out. Uh, I have thirty-one dollars and fifty-three cents from our previous runner, the Prince of None, uh, d celebrating a very respectable time right there. Who says? Meow. 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 Uh, Pips, you have to meow. There's no avoiding it. So I hope those picked up on Discord. Uh, anyway, can we please get Cat into the lead? And I, I hate to break it to you, Prince, but um, Dog actually has taken a significant lead thanks to a very generous $100 donation from Beautiful Dandy. So uh, we're gonna need some work on the cat. If you want more meows, we're gonna need some work on the cat. Um, is there time for a little more? Go for it. Uh, we do have five dollars, uh, that's very relevant from a goof who just says cat, 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 cat. Cat. Thank you, goof. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent job, goofed. <laughs> Man, I don't know if you guys saw that, but Orcrist, uh, got, in my opinion, supremely trolled, uh, because he was trying to land headshots on Windblight, and one of them just went straight through Windblight's head and did not actually make contact with his hitbox. I'm not sure how that happened exactly, but uh, he recovered from it nicely, but it's got to be frustrating from uh, from a runner's standpoint to aim your arrow shot appropriately and, and the game just says no thank you. PT, meanwhile, um, very quick uh, Shrine of Resurrection clip. We talked about that earlier and uh, he handled that very nicely. An old any percent pro. He's done that hundreds, if not thousands, of times, probably. And um, we're going rogue. We're, we're going rogue. <laughs> I love it. Rogue time. <laughs> so TT is going to be doing a completely different um, route than what we just saw Nat do, and he's throwing it back to the old days of any percent <laughs> in the pre BLSS um, era when we got around from shrine to shrine via BTBs. So it'll give us the chance to talk about um, a very cool and unfortunately almost now obsolete movement tech. Very, very sorely missed uh, any percent. And uh, all dungeons used to be notorious for having absolutely the worst, most painful uh, BTB setups uh, in the game. Um, but yeah, no, I... Uh, we were talking about incentives and stuff like that, and then I threw around the idea of doing an old uh, any percent run, mainly because it's my preferred run. I am actually not a big fan of the BLSS route. Um, while BLSS is faster, it's just not as cool or, or fun to me. So I uh, decided to completely to, valid to kick it old school. Yeah, I feel like a lot of I've heard a lot of runners express that exact thing that it's um, it's faster and it's more efficient, oh, but God. it's it's much less fun. Oh no. Having some targeting issues here. That's okay. I was smart and got food. We love it when Link targets those bokos when you don't want him to. Yeah. Always at the most inopportune time. So an example of, of exactly what TT was just talking about is oh, no. Orcrist. <laughs> oh dear. Oh, oh no. God. Jump, jump, That's jump, so jump. Bad. Yep. All right. Oh. That was bad. Oh dear. <laughs> uh, hey. Yeah. So th this is how uh, any percent started. <laughs> <laughs> Nat gave you a nice cushion to work with, so uh, so you're good. All right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so Orcrus just got from Rito Village and is arriving all the way at Gerudo Town, which are literally two different corners of the map in in one BLSS. You know, in, in what 45 seconds, maybe a minute of game time. Um, in the pre BLSS days, that would have taken a warp back to Plateau and at least one, maybe two, tricky, difficult BTBs. Um, it's just uh, in so much incredibly easier now than it used to be. Um, and uh, it changed the run to make it much more accessible, but also in a lot of people's opinion, much less interesting, much less fun. Uh, but there's, you know, differences of opinion on that for sure. ET getting skew on the side of the stasis shrine and um, clipping in very nicely. One of the advantages also of the newer BLSS plateau route is that um, you can use 
the skew left over from Magnesis to clip easily into Stasis. But with the old Stasis first plateau route, um, that's the first skew that you're getting. Might I interrupt for some very pointed donations? For sure. I have $20 here from Abonese, a fellow host, who says, Big congratulations to Nat for getting a Plateau PB in a marathon and also learning this run so quickly, yet SMASHING IT in all caps. All the runs so far have been so much fun. Big thank you to everyone involved. And I must echo the sentiment. Uh, the, the, those clips were clean. Oh, Gorgeous. thank you. <laughs> Abby, I love you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we also have $10 here from Dancer for Daydreams, who says, Go TT! Go TT. Thank you so much. Woo! OTT indeed. All right, we finished stasis. And Orcrist, meanwhile, is advancing the Gerudo um, quest here. There's quite a few things you have to do um, before the game will let you board Vometo, including a face off with uh, the Grand Master of the Yiga Clan, Master Koga, everyone's favorite boss fight. So we have that to look forward to. But he's purchasing some arrows because he does need. Um, ice arrows for some BTBs coming up shortly, which we'll see some BTBs from TT here uh, in just a moment as well. And then fire arrows, which I believe are tied to the incentive. Orcrist at the end of, or near the end of his run, has to detour to Quark Forest and use a glitch to pull the Master Sword um, because that incentive was met. Nice job to all of our donators who made that happen. So he needs uh, fire arrows and um, a piece of wood to make that happen for the, the stupidest, easiest uh, early Master Sword glitch um, you'll ever see. Hey. Uh -huh. early, early Master Sword has always been and will forever be uh, the worst category. <laughs> Agreed. <laughs> uh, in this game. Uh, it's, it's really, really dumb how uh, fast it is to get it. Um, all right. So while TT makes his way up to the snowy area, I'll just kind of give the super quick intro to BTBs. Um, BTBs abuse the bullet time mechanic that Breath of the Wild has built into its physics system. Um, when you shield surf and land with your shield on a ragdolling enemy in bullet time, the game miscalculates the, uh, the physics interaction. So TT is going to shoot some arrows to lure this red book goblin in the right spot. Oh, I got the timing right. Let's go. Let's go. Not an easy. Done. Yeah. Ugh. That's a textbook BTB right there. That one in particular is annoying because you can do everything right and still have the Bokoblin notice you, which messes up the setup. Um, but TT executed that perfectly, luring him to a very precise spot with an arrow shot and then um, timing his jump uh, very precisely. Getting a third try ESC into um, the Krynos Shrine, which is not bad at all. Orcris, meanwhile, did uh, was doing a BTB at the exact same time. We were ignoring him a little bit. Sorry, Orcris, but he's got another one coming up here. Orcris are a little bit different because he is um, using different enemies. So um, one was with, a, I think, a Black Bokoblin, and this one is a Black Moblin. Those yep. don't ragdoll just from shield surfing onto them so he's having to freeze them with ice arrows which will cause them to have that ragdoll effect looks like he got a really really good one actually very nice yeah that one in particular is really satisfying because you get you have to get so much height to get just barely mm -hmm. up and over this snowy ridge and it drops you right down to the back door of the giga clan hideout um <laughs> If you remember this from your casual playthrough, the Yiga Clan hideout is kind of annoying. You have to sneak around, and um, anytime a Yiga uh, sees you, you get, like, you know, mobbed by uh, Blade Masters and killed and sent back to the beginning. Uh, but we're just going to sneak through the back door with the shield clip, and um, you have to actually enter the, the Yiga Clan hideout to trigger this Koga boss battle. But once we've entered the back door, we just have to go back into the arena, and uh, we will get to face off with Master Koga. 
And while he is at, has that intro going, um, I am going to be setting up for the second most difficult BTB in this run. Uh, this is the BTB to Magnesis. Um, it just has a very weird uh, window timing to get the optimal BTB. Uh, so we're going to try our best here. We'll let him do it and then kind of explain some of the particulars in a moment. That looks good. Excellent. So while he flies here, um, we can prage really quickly for the possibility of an unloaded Magnesis Shrine. It is possible to get here so quickly the game can't catch up and leaves the Shrine in a half-loaded state. It's loaded. Ah. So I'm going to take my time to get some extra arrows. Yeah. That was... Um, it's one of those things that is unfortunately out of our control. Again, you can do everything right. TT got the perfect angle, great height and speed, and sometimes the game just loads and uh, not much you can do about it. But it is possible to arrive at the shrine so quickly that the game hasn't had a chance to load the door, and you can just walk right in and skip the um, shield clipping that we see him doing right now. You can even get an optimal angle to where the, the, the shrine will be unloaded and you land literally in front of the door. So you just have to yeah. turn and walk to the elevator. Uh, this uh, Oh, go ahead, TT. I was just saying, we're in Magnesis. This is the most boring shrine, so I was actually going to say, we'll throw it back to Newborn. Go ahead, talk about the boss fight. Yeah, Koga is kind of a fun uh, little boss fight. With the Royal Claimer and the Ancient Arrows, it's a lot easier than it used to be. But Orchrist is relying on a, a kind of unique mechanic called double hits, where when you start a spinning two-handed weapon attack and you're facing away from the target, um, you can get double hits um, where it has two hits for every rotation. He also got a very unique uh, phase three double hit where this is the only time we use this mechanic in the entire game. When you, If you drag the Magnesis ball on the ground um, and release it just before it actually hits Koga, um, it double hits for reasons that are not really clear to anybody, I don't think. Uh, but that was just discovered within the last year or so, and it skips the whole second phase of that, um, or the second cycle of that phase. It's a very clean Thunderhelm segment from, from Orcrist. After a little bit of scuffling in Plateau, he's really putting together a very nice um, mid-game. TT, Greg was kind to you today. Greg was nice. Greg was nice. Does the um, does the Cryonis Guardian have a name, or is it just Greg who gets named? Uh, that's Chad. Chad. Okay. That's funny. I'm learning so much. I didn't know the yeah, names. I, I've just been kind of learning these things in my little this corner. Is the, so the TT yeah. lore. <laughs> yeah. Um, I have a habit of naming things. That's a good thing. I, uh, I appreciate that. Um, so like the blights are actually uh. The Blighty Boys, they're uh, Hyrule's number one H-pop group. Oh, okay. Um, hey, I'm recalling this from watching Alex years ago. Alexander yeah, Lynn. It, so, yeah. it was a whole lore that uh, me and my uh, chat had come up with. Oh, God, that barrel. Okay. So those were two of my favorite um, tricks right there. Uh, box Walk, which is a stasis launch where uh, you stasis a box, launch in the air, and then... Um, kind of just walk as it flies across the air. It just looks really cool. Um, and then also that that uh, that BTB to bombs is uh, just one of my favorites. It's just super gratifying. It's really cool. Orcris, meanwhile, kind of getting hecked a little bit. Um, one of the funny things about BLSS is that the angle that Link gets launched at is very much dependent by the geometry of the step up slope that you're using and these irregular slopes that you see that he was using um, sometimes have a habit of sending you in weird directions, sometimes at very high speeds. And um, he got launched backwards and ended up dropping that BLSS for a thing that really is kind of outside of his control. Um, but he was able to recover from that and is heading back to Riju. Now that he has the Thunder Helm, it will okay him to head over to um, begin the assault on Divine Beast Fa Naboris and um, face off with Thunderblight in Thunderblight's home arena, which is a little bit trickier, I think, than facing him in Sanctum because of the environmental factors that are at play there. But we'll get more into that here in a few minutes, I think. May I steal those few minutes for some donations? Go for it. 
Y'all are keeping me busy. Uh, we have $50 from The King's Pride, my co-racer from last night, who says, I'm here to honor my promise. So that's 48 items gathered, $48 given for the Signs of the Sojourner race, plus I'll throw in an extra two for Thunder being such a good boy. Thank you so much for having us, and good luck to the rest of the runners. Uh, also... I have $40 here, which I'm assuming is meant to cheer on Orchrist for the upcoming fights. Um, it is from Orchrist Fan for Life. No message, just just being a fan. I also am an Orchrist fan for life. <laughs> I am I am big Orchrist fan. Uh, Orchrist, Orchrist actually is a really good friend of mine. We started running Breath of the Wild approximately the same time. I think he started about a month or two before I did. Um, so I, I, when he asked me to, to join this uh, relay, I, I, I jumped in without hesitation. Yeah, Orcris, just to uh, talk him up even a little bit more, um, has put a ton of time into creating resources for the betterment of the community. Um, one of the folks who has just made tutorial video after tutorial video for everything from wind bombs to the SCW glitch, which is notorious for its all shrines applications and everything in between. So big shout outs to the work that he's put into um, not just running the game really well, but also making the community a better and more accessible place. Oh, it's time for everyone's favorite or one of the favorite tricks, hell tree. Uh, so I got to hit this. Uh, I'm going to knock this tree off a little bit. Freeze it with stasis. Hit it a bunch. Direct it with an arrow, and then we're going to grab onto it. Grab a branch, apparently. Okay. And then we're going to go for a little ride. Yeah, that branch is actually really critical for the Ganon fight to come, for Calamity. So, yeah. It's the clickbait title of this uh, of this YouTube compilation. Watch TT beat Ganon with a tree branch. Oh, yeah, yeah. You think Point Crow's done it, but <laughs> you haven't seen TT take it. In the middle of a marathon, too. Yeah, the TT, that's a very hard trick that TT made look very, very easy. Um, it Link does not like grabbing the tree. Sometimes no. um, the double hits just don't work. Um, sometimes something falling off of the tree gets in your way. And um, he made it look much, much easier than it actually is. If you stasis it too early, it'll just fall over. Um, but now for the stressful part. Uh, so remember how I said Magnesis was the second hardest trick? Uh, this is going to be the hardest trick of the run. This is the Castle BTB. Uh, this is a one frame uh, BTB, so I'm going to concentrate here real quick. Got it. Oh god, alright, I can breathe. Incredible. So the Castle BTB is extremely difficult because you only have about uh, one to two frames in order to get the uh, correct amount of stamina to power glide all the way over here to Castle. Um, usually you would go straight up to the dining hall, uh, but I'm actually going to drop down and get some safety arrows just to make the boss rush a little bit easier. Um, but this uh, that, that trick is was the run killer. Um, if you miss that on PB pace, uh, you had to reload and you lost. You would lose about 20, 30 seconds uh, yeah. just from that. So um, I'm very happy I got that first try. Yeah, well done, man. Yeah, that was beautiful. Thank you. Whew. And also, I imagine a big like relief. <laughs> oh, yeah, I feel way better after getting that. All right. Orchrist has uh, hopped his way onto uh, Divine Beast Va Naboris. Um, had a pretty cool uh, little, I don't know if you call it a skip necessarily, but... Um, the game wants you to follow Riju on your sand seal, and that's a little bit slow. So Orcris ditched the sand seal and ditched Riju. She even tried to summon him back to the fight, and he's like, nah. Uh, and uh, Wind Bomb plus a BLSS um, directly to the Divine Beast and deactivated the feet with bomb arrows. Um, oh, no nanners. I got one nanner. I'm not doing amiibo, though, so. I'm, I'm doing amiibo, so I don't need him. <laughs> I'm going to scan up here. Remember the old days of the no amiibo dining hall route when you had to pray for bananas. Yep. Yeah, the old the no amiibo route was actually uh, really very similar. Um, 
but it was also very annoying because you had to collect uh, a beetle that was had an RNG position on Great Plateau after bombs, and then you also had to uh, break that crate to get, what was it, two bananas or three bananas? I think th two bananas. Yeah, it was two bananas. Um, all right, cool. And we got two scans for fish. Dope. This trick that Orcris is doing right now is one of one of the scary points in the run because it's one of the only times where if you miss it, it really requires a reload. And you might not think that is all that big of a deal, but with the active IST glitch, it, it really kind of is a big deal. Um, reloading after having completed a Divine Beast will actually dupe your champion's abilities, which breaks them. Um, he has Revali's Gale in his inventory right now, and um, you can't reload. If you have to reload, you have to close the entire game to clear the glitch and then reload. So um, that neck trick where he used a shock arrow to activate the neck terminal, um, you have kind of uh, some finicky movement to get down, and uh, oh dear. Uh, we got there. We're fine. He noticed you. Yeah. Oh, and because awesome. you grab those other arrows, you don't have to get the. Uh, no, I'm getting. No, I, I, I have to go back and sneak strike him, so I just have to get oh, away gotcha. from him. Okay, it's been so long since I've watched this old dining hall route. I've forgotten how it works. Yeah, it's. Uh, <laughs> I got. I got to land behind him. Sneak strike. Because I need that. There we go. <laughs> oh yeah, I guess the claymore is pretty important. Yeah, it's kind of a big deal. Plus the. Uh, <laughs> Plus that rusty shield, you got to have the rusty shield. That's Actually, a requirement. Having having bonus shields during this run is always a good thing. Yeah, not a problem there. <laughs> mm -hmm. These crates Especially here that you're... he's breaking open are full of arrows that he is going to use to help in his Ganon fight and boss rush. Nice. Ooh, got ten bonner arrows, I think, there. Nice. Which is huge. All right, he's still here. Cool. I'm sorry. Did you just? Pull ten bomb arrows out of a fire. Yeah. <laughs> I, I have no questions. I'm sorry. I also Maybe just you flew. Do that on a regular. I also just flew across an entire field in my underwear. So you know. <laughs> oh well, that's just Tuesday. That's just like that. A... That's normal. I, I have questions about physics, <laughs> not about flying. <laughs> Well, this isn't the game for those questions. <laughs> Zelda games are not one for physics questions. Especially Breath of the Wild. Ugh. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no. Uh, Another annoying part of the old route is trying to sneak strike these guys. How did that the game work? Won't, oh, jeez. The game won't let you cook if the enemies are nearby and have noticed you, so he needs the weapon here, the uh, Brice Rock. I probably pronounced that horribly wrong. Um, but he also needs the cooking pot to be active, and the Moblin is preventing that right now. He knows me. Come on. Well, give us a chance to look at Orchrist as he um, just absolutely wrecks Thunderblight. He's got the Great Eagle Bow, which was his reward for completing Vometo, and the Great Eagle Bow is an incredible bow. Triple shot, high damage, high fire rate, high durability, um, and combined with Ancient Arrows, just absolutely obliterates the rest of the bosses. The second phase is going to be a little bit tricky because he's got a shield. You have to use, you have to electrocute him with these uh, metal spikes in order to break the shield. But once that happens, um, it's more the same. This might be a little tricky. Let's this, see if we can... <laughs> this is going to be dicey. Let's see if we can do the uh, the good old look up trick. Yeah, no problem. There's definitely not enemies nearby. <laughs> definitely so not. Much no. in, so much in the Ooh. game is determined by what your camera is actually looking at. Like the Moblin is right next to him, but because it's not on camera, the game's like, oh yeah, go ahead and cook. There's no enemies mm -hmm. nearby. I also got a crit there. Which is actually really, really good because... Uh, these uh these fights can get a little sketchy on this route. So crit with extra time. Yeah. Nice. Nice. Sometimes you get a crit and it just gives you extra hearts that are completely useless when you only have three hearts anyways. But the extra yeah. time is very nice. Mm -hmm. This is a good time to talk about um, the lag factor um, in Breath of the Wild, specifically pertaining to wind bombs. Uh, 
we speedrunners have a love-hate relationship with lag in this game. Sometimes it's really useful. Um, you'll see Orcrest occasionally intentionally induce lag in order to get a super launch, which we haven't even talked about yet. Maybe we'll find a chance to squeeze that in here in a little bit. But um, Castle is so laggy that if you have too much stuff on your screen, um, the wind bombs will just fail. Um, we call it getting lag stopped or lagged out. And uh, that looked like what happened on that first wind bomb is uh, got a little bit of a lag stop going on. But here he will be setting up his windblight skip, which is exactly the same as how Nat did it earlier. Um, his boss rush is going to look different, though. Um, we talked about how how scripted and how tightly routed the weapons are, and that is still true even in this old route, but there's also the variability of, like, how many arrows do you have? Um, the new, the newer route that Nat ran relies not at all on arrow RNG, whereas the mm -hmm. old route that TT ran is very much so dependent on how many arrows do you get, what kind of arrows do you get, what kind of damage can you do. Um, he has no ancient arrows at all, and so um, he's going to uh, have to kind of play things a little bit improvisationally, not so much in Blights, but in the Calamity Ganon fight itself. May I sneak in a very important announcement? Please do. Sure. Um, we have now surpassed $2,000 total. Woo! Let's go. Let's go. Let's hear it. Uh, that comes to us courtesy of uh, a $103 donation from Beautiful Dandy, who says, Cat Gang, we can be united in getting ghosts to wear cat ears. Which... Thank you so much. We have surpassed our $2,000 milestone, and uh, now Ghost will be wearing cat ears during Stray. However, I do have um, some interesting news also on that donation, because that, that $103 seems to have gone to picking dog. <laughs> <laughs> so cat crew, I, I'm, I'm gonna need to, to see some more donations if we want even more cats than we have already acquired. Um, however, $2,000 is not the end, y'all, uh, because our next goal is specifically $2,536, which I know we can do, to raise more than we did at Rejects and Friends 1 last summer. Um, and uh, that would be so meaningful to all of us behind the scenes. So remember, everyone, great cause and also cats. Or dogs. Or cats. Thank you so much to all of you who've donated. Orcrist um, is entered a really, really exciting part of the run. It's literally like seven minutes of cutscenes punctuated by 30 second bursts of gameplay. Um, we uh, have lovingly dubbed the section of the run fish drama because fish the, drama. Uh, the Zora are being all dramatic about, uh, you know, their anti Hylian prejudices and things like that. Uh, but it's really, um, there's not much to do here other than mashers. Uh, so we'll pay attention to TT as he um, heads into Thunderblight here and then prepares for the uh, Calamity Ganon showdown. I like how we have TT on the right and then we have like the T, like the gossip happening on the left. Mm. All the triple T effect triple going on T. right now. That's, Absolutely. That's a good one. Do you thank think you, that the you. water in Zora's domain is just T? Mm. Mm. That's a good point, especially, I mean, no spoilers for Tears of a Kingdom, but ideas, potentially. Oh. Mm -hmm. mm. This second phase Thunderblade is kind of funny because um, that boomerang throw is, I think, the only reason why we specifically need to pick up a boomerang, even in the newer castle route that doesn't really... Shouldn't need it outside of that one throw, but you've got to be able to break Thunderblight Shield from the air, and um, doing it with Magnesis is super slow. So we still get that boomerang, um, even though we don't really use it very much outside of that. Here, TT is going to be kind of dancing with Calamity and trying to land as many headshots. Oh, come on. Give me the flurry rush. Middle claw there is kind of an unfortunate there we one. Go. Calamity can throw quite a few different melee attacks, and some of them are easier to flurry rush than others. The The big 
fire sword horizontal swipe is by far the easiest flurry rush window. The one that he got right off the bat, the middle claw um, probably swipe the, is really Probably the hard. worst one. Yeah. <laughs> So he's got a little durability left on his Royal Guards bow and some bomb arrows. He's, the goal here is to land as many headshots as possible. Um, when the Royal Guards bow uh, breaks, he's got a Royal Bow, which is a little bit less damage and a little bit slower shooting, but still very powerful. And with this old weapon routing, very nicely done. Um, Calamity almost always ends up going to the wall at some point, so you've got to have a couple of bomb arrows to be able to knock him down off the wall, otherwise it can get really hairy really quickly. Mm. Hey, E.T. is strategically saving some bomb arrows just in case he goes wall again. And you can see here the game is just kind of keeping a nice medium even distance away from Calamity to um, be able to spray him with arrows over and over and over again. And phase one is down very nice, very clean. Now we pray for laser. Nope, he's going wall. Oh, yeah. This well, really sucks. This is what you want to avoid. And, and unfortunately, there's just not really much you can do about it other than pray. Oh, okay. Uh, he, gave me, he gave me fireball at least. So to get Calamity off the wall in phase two, he's got his invulnerability shield up, and you have to parry one of his attacks. As you can see, that fireball moves pretty slowly and is forgiving in terms of the parry timing. It's really slow, but it's very safe. And so TT now is getting into um, the stun lock. So with the entirety of phase two, with these two-handed spinning weapons, um, if we time the slam properly, we can keep him in this perpetually stunned phase where his shield is down. And so as long as he maintains his timing, the fight is basically over. <laughs> Looking very good so far. Trying to get as mm -hmm. many double and triple hits as possible. Yeah, this is the point of a route that I'm quite stuck at. But I know in a week or two, it'll be easy. Especially right. once there's no like pressure of this. Like It'll just come, you know, it'll happen tomorrow that I, everything clicks. But <laughs> Okay, I can breathe now. Beautiful. Yay! Very, very nicely done. Um, Calamity on the older route is a little bit more stressful than I feel on the newer one. Um, just because of the inconsistencies of having to nail so many headshots. Uh, with the newer route, we are spoiled with Ancient Arrows, which just do a massive amount of damage to him. Um, so it makes it makes the fight, like, in the new route, you can actually have an optimal fight uh, every time if you... If you if you do it correctly, uh, mm -hmm. this old the older route it's very much RNG based. So yeah, uh, happy happy it worked out. Orcrest over here going probably for a one cycle on this route to entry. It's very difficult, very tight timing. He got the first two shots very well, very nicely done. That's a hard hard strat. It saves time, uh, but it's very, very easy to mess up. It, on one stam wheel, you have to get that first pre-fire and then three very efficient um, other shots. And uh, he made it look much, much easier than it actually is. <laughs> E.T., what can you tell us here about this uh, very difficult Dark Beast Ganon fight? The Biggie Piggy. Um, <laughs> it's the auto-scroller. Uh... Essentially, we just have to go through the motions here, um, shooting lit targets on uh, the sides of Dark Beast. There is some optimal movement, which I'm sure you'll see from Senor Tapir. He, he has one of the best Dark Beasts in the game. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a very simplistic way to end. Uh, you can die here, uh, potentially. <laughs> um, I've done it's it numerous times. Us. Yep. <laughs> uh, but thankfully, it's uh, not punishing. It doesn't put you back at the beginning of the boss rush. It just puts you beginning oh gosh, at the beginning good. of this segment. That's nice, at least, because, yeah. Um, and Ganon, if you die, you get, yeah, put it to, before you walk into Sanctum. Or yep. potentially even Zelda study. <laughs> yeah, depending on, on where the loading uh, happened for it. But, yeah. Cool. And then we're going to be uh, getting to go. So, Tapir, get ready to go, man. I'm on it. Oh, what? 
Jeff. <gasps> the horse's name is Jeff, and that's <laughs> from Orcrist. <laughs> Jeff not being terribly cooperative for you right now. Orcrist <laughs> um, is, this is actually kind of cool because the Divine Beast uh, routes have not changed all that much in a long time, uh, with the and exception of GGTT. Yay, Excellent GG. Job. And good luck to Tapir. Um, this final, this uh, this Ruta route is actually new in that we rearranged the order of the terminals um, relatively recently to eliminate the dependency on the, the, the cycles of the water wheels. Um, that used to be the, the big sticking point of this one is trying to time it so that you got the optimal cycle of the water wheels and doing that first one first helps with that a lot. Orcris barely got that up high enough to get out of there. If you get stuck down in the water, there can be a huge pain to get out. One thing I don't think we've mentioned yet is that uh, you may or may not have noticed this. Orcris is playing um, in Italian, whereas our any percent runners have been playing in French. Um, the fastest languages for this game is purely dependent on category and which cutscenes you get and which elements of voice acting um, come into play. Um, so for any percent, uh, European French is the fastest, and for Italian with the additional Divine Beast cutscenes, uh, or sorry, for all dungeons with the additional Divine Beast cutscenes, um, Italian ends up being a, a couple of seconds faster. Maybe it's not a huge difference. Yeah, and it's important to note that uh, it's mainly uh, it's mainly the the text boxes, but also voice acting does play uh, in all dungeons plays more of a role. But mm -hmm. um, in any percent, you can actually use French with any voice acting language that you want. It doesn't matter. Oh, um, really? Yeah, uh, the French text boxes are what's fastest. It's kind of kind of crazy. Other other categories feature. There's even some that have English as the fastest language. I think all shrines in Hundo. Um, typically are run in English. Actually, Hundo's usually run in like whatever the runner's native language is because there's so many dialogue options yeah. you have to choose correctly. But um, And isn't like English and, and Russian technically like neck and neck, like one frame different? So it's just like... Something like that. Yeah. yeah. Um, All Shrines is in English and uh, that was actually discovered by Orcris that English is actually faster. We discovered that on the Labyrinth uh, Shrines that French um, gave an additional text box each time. So Really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. so English is actually the fastest uh, for all shrines. Yeah, That's English convenient. and Russian both get the, the faster text boxes there, I, I believe. All right. So Tapir is going back to the current... Uh, BLSS route, so you get to see this, uh, and you'll see how much faster uh, the route is in comparison. Um, Tapir is uh, and has been one of the top runners of uh, Breath of the Wild for a long time, um, especially in categories like AMQ or All Main Quests and uh, a couple other ones. Um, sorry, he's done AD relatively recently too, and obviously any percent. But yeah, really, really talented runner. Um, <laughs> And you'll see him, one of the interesting things that you'll see from him is I'm sure he'll go for some of the harder, more advanced uh, shrine strats on Great Plateau. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, implementing more difficult and faster wind bombs that are riskier, but he is good enough to pull those off pretty well. So that'll be a, a treat to watch. Yeah, and for those in my community um, still in chat, um, Tapir is also, I believe, second place or second or third place in dog percent, which is... The main reason I learned Plateau was so I could do Dog Percent in Breath of the Wild. That was the main run that I cared about learning in Breath of the Wild. So, <laughs> hence why I didn't know any percent until now. So, <laughs> I think I'm Dog Percent's a lot of fun, though. place right now. Around there. It's so much fun. I can't wait to go back after grinding this and definitely we'll have a better Plateau. For sure. Going into Dog Percent, so. And better Wind Bombs, too. Mm-hmm. And you That's a that category where you get the tower, right? Yes, yeah, you go for to bombs, send a tower, and that's where you, speaking of the lag, um, a while ago, that's where you need to have the, that's where lag is really helpful to get out of the ragdoll state since you don't have the mm -hmm. paraglider there. Um, and I typically put, turn on the VR headset, so then you see double, just to make it easier for myself to get the lag. Yeah. 
Yeah, they're, you're strategically forcing a lag stop so that um, you can fall damage cancel out of it. Mm -hmm. Orcrist is going to head off here to um, Goron City for the last dungeon. And this is super, like, just a super fun part of the run to watch because once he gets to Goron City, he's going to be on fire the entire time. Yeah. The entirety of the Divine Beast approach, all of the Save Yonobo stuff, um, he's just going to burn and um, be continually using fairies uh, because we have enough fairies to tank that damage. We don't need to buy clothes. It would be slower to buy clothes, cost more rupees. So we're just going to let it burn, and um, it's pretty amusing to watch. Depeer uh, went for what we call Gamer Wind Bomb for... Um... The bomb shrine where you stand on the peg. I think I, I tried it in mine too, but um, it's a very difficult trick. Uh, instead of doing the kind of setup that um, Nat did in bombs where you land on the upper platform, if you do the gamer setup, you can actually fly immediately straight to the monk's platform. Uh, it saves a good chunk of time, but it is a much more exact uh, wind bomb in terms of timing. Yeah, it's one of those where you, you need to manipulate it so that you have a very low angle so you don't bonk against the ceiling and uh, it's it's real hard to do that Orcrist here is having to curve this BLSS to try to wind around the mountain and get into Goron City you can see he's already started burning um, one of the reasons why we get the golden or no not the golden bow what's it called the uh, the royal bow which is golden in color but um, is that it's metal and it won't burn um, if you have a wooden bow there's a burn timer um, that if it burns for like 30 seconds or something, it'll just burn up. And um, we usually want to avoid our weapons from burning up needlessly. So the golden or the, the royal bow um, is immune to that burn damage. Tapir is... is scanning for his amiibo here. A lot of runners will do this right after the bomb shrine just to get the RNG factor out of the way. Looks like he got a good scan, too. He had uh, two Porgy and a Carp, I think. So Perfect. he is fine on fish. And that means, I think, that he can skip the Razor Shroom in Castle, right? Uh, Maybe. I forget. <laughs> yeah, I kind of like... just grabbed a Razor Shroom just for double-checking. <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty so. sure he can skip. So um, how we determine this is actually a point system in cooking in, in Breath of the Wild. Um, and you need to get enough ingredients to make six points to get an attack up level three. Um, I think he should be fine with double Porgy and a cart, because that should equal six. Mm -hmm. Here, Orcrist is looking for unloaded rocks at the entrance to the Yenobo cave. It should be good. Nice. That's another one of those, like, you know, love-hate relationships with loading, where um, if, if those rocks load, you have to ESC through the back of the cave, which is a pain. Um, but a good fast turn wind bomb will usually get you in the cave before the cutscene or before the uh, the rocks load. And then once you're inside the cave, the game assumes that you've blown the rocks up with the cannons like it wants you to. So it just takes them out of the way um, and he can get back out. No problem. And I'm going to be interested to see if Tapir goes for Canal. You've got to think he will. He probably will. Let's see. If he does the shield jump here, yeah, he's going oh. for it. So yeah. we said Gamer was exact. Uh, Canal is so annoyingly bad, and he nailed it. That was a really good Perfect. one. Perfect. With the ragdoll cancel, everything. Um, Solid. That, that wind bomb saves so much time in this run, but it is such a pain because you have to get it low enough where you can make it all to the end, but also you need to get it high enough so you can make it over the ledge in front of you. Um, so it's a very, very tight window for a detonation and, and placing your bombs and everything like that. So absolutely nailed it, um, which is awesome. And he will be starting the next slide over to Stasis. Yeah, it's one of those wind bombs where tiny, tiny differences in how the timing of dropping your bombs, the timing of entering bullet time, the timing of detonation, um, can be the difference between nailing it or failing it. The peer is also notoriously uh, a fast BLSS wiggler, and you'll see him just zoom up the slope at unbelievable speeds. The 
So for anyone who is wondering about oh, like no. learning how to bliss, you don't actually like the the speed of the wiggle isn't absolutely critical. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, it's just consistency over the middle point. Yeah. Oh, as long as as long as you're going from uh we say between uh nine o'clock and three o'clock on the uh the the left stick, um you are more than fine with uh timing. Um I know Nuki Dog and myself both are uh, what we call slow flickers, where um, you can build up just as much speed, it just takes a little bit longer. Um, but if you're like consistent and accurate with it, uh, you can actually joysticks fairly slowly and still get some insane, uh, insane speed. I accidentally pressed Y on my controller during that slide. Mm. Um, oh no, I was wondering what happened. It just kind of stopped. I was like, what's going on? Yeah, with the BLSS, you have to hold down B the whole time. If you press any other input button with your controller by mistake, it'll drop the slide. If you let go of B, it'll drop the slide. If you let your left stick go neutral, it'll drop the slide. So it can be a little bit kind of tricky to get that input combination down and fast. Yeah, BLSS uh, can be kind of hard to control because, like Newborn just said, you have to hold down B the entire time. So if you're trying to move the camera around, you have to, like, Press B with your thumb and then reach your pointer finger over your thumb to get the right stick, and it's it's a mess. It's a mess. Um, so, uh, but it's fast, so we do it. Yeah, it's one of those things where everybody has their own kind of little unique technique for how they hold the controller and how they press the different buttons, and what works for you may not work for everyone else. Very nice stasis wind bomb there. Yeah, getting a beautiful little stasis wind bomb. That one's pretty forgiving. Um, it's not as tight as the other two shrines, uh, but definitely again saves uh, saves more time. Um, the getting bombs first really uh, the bombs first route of Great Plateau really changed things up uh, versus the old way that I did it, where it's stasis first. Um, having access to wind bombs in every shrine just minimalizes any kind of issue they caused, um, and then you know BLSS is just in, insanely fast. And consistent, too. I mean, the BTBs have an inherent level of inconsistency, and if you miss the BTB, it's usually a reload. Um, so it just, even more so, for me at least, even more so than the speed is the, the consistency is the benefit. Yeah. It definitely made uh, Great Plateau and, and Castle and, like, learning the full 80% route, like, a lot more um, accessible to people because you can do this stuff. You don't have to be going super fast like Tapir does, or even as fast as it, how Nat does it. Um, it. It's just a very, uh, it's it's a very forgiving um, way of, of running the game now versus the uh, old way where I remember I spent two weeks learning that first bullet time bounce to cry on us. Right. I think it took me days before I even landed it one time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was because uh, bullet time bounces require you to get the right uh, shooting positions you have to get the right aiming positions after you lure the mobs over. You have to get the right timing for the jump, the right timing mm -hmm. for bullet time, the right timing yep. for ending bullet time. Like, there's a lot that goes into it versus just grab something and wiggle away. Yeah, no, I remember trying to learn that, and my brain was just not computing. I mean, I did get the one from... You kind of have to do, for the old route, you had to do the um, bullet time to uh, cryo, but I didn't... I. That's why I kind of stopped learning any percent at that point, because I did not want to do the frame perfect one to castle. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, this part that Orcus is doing right now um, is a little bit of an annoying part of the run because you have to drag Yanobo along with you, and if you get too far ahead of him, he just stops and doesn't know what to do because he's a brainless idiot. So um, you, you want to go fast, but it's one of those places where you can't go too fast because otherwise you leave your buddy behind. And you need your buddy. And um, I will say that uh, even though this is still painful because it is an escort quest, uh, it was a lot worse. It was. Um, since uh, the Discovery IST and the fact that Orcus just has an almost unlimited amount of ancient arrows, uh, he can just shoot everything to get rid of it. Uh, previously, uh, runners actually had to do uh, strats to get by these... Um, guardians in a, a timely manner so uh mm -hmm. it's completely made it a lot easier uh but yeah yunobo used to be an even bigger pain because you used to have to actually have to actually make him stop and and come to you right 
Yeah, it was a combination of sneaking around some of the Guardian sentries and then using Magnesis to smack some of them with giant boxes. And um, then I think most runners used some Urbosa's Furies on the uh, the last couple of them. And it was a lot slower and a lot more finicky, so the Ancient Arrows definitely make it a lot easier. May I sneak in with a quick donation? Sure. I have here, first of all, $10 from Shower TS, who did not leave a comment, but thank you so much, Shower, for donating to Planned Parenthood Federation of America. And also $4 from Beautiful Dandy, who says, I dedicate this cat dono to Goof and the rest of the cat gang. I think you're all cool. Would all of you look at that beautiful olive branch? That is so kind. Also, love you, shower. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, so much for donating for this entire event. And reminder that if you, too, would like to be part of donating to a wonderful cause with the rest of the rejects and the friends, uh, that's exclamation point donate in the chat, and it'll take you straight there. Yes, definitely keep those donations coming in. Um, we've already passed the $2,000 mark. Can we Can we get to the $3,500? let us do it. Oh, I believe in us. Mm. I always have faith. Chat can do wonders. All right, so Tapir is done with Plateau and is now sliding his way over to castle he's going to be going in again a different part of castle guess what you're getting the full tour of hyrule castle die um mainly because of chat wonderfully hit our incentive and he has to go retrieve the hillian shield before he can take on the rest of the bosses oh that's right i forgot about that i was like why he looks like he's going too far to the left what's he yeah, doing yeah no he's got to go he's got to go fight a big boy to get a uh, to get the hillian shield he does i don't even remember where he grabs weapons to fight that big boy I'm pretty sure they're all within the jail cell area. Um, I don't remember exactly. <laughs> nice. Hyrule Castle. Um, you get the treat of it being very, very unloaded there. Um, that can actually be dangerous because the malice is still there, even if you can't see it. Um, or it can load in very suddenly, and um, it, the malice takes a lot of damage really quickly. Oh, there he goes. He just goes and picks up a Royal Guards Claymore. Just no problem. Here. Yeah, Casual. The strongest weapon in the game. So Tapir's gonna hop down to the end of the hallway and fight a Stalnox, which will unlock the Hylian um, shield. And then I believe he will warp back out to the uh, the entrance to Castle to make his approach to um, the main part of Castle and the weapons collection. So he goes bullet time, shoots the eye of the Stalnox, and then we'll run over. Turn around to get double hits with the Royal Guards Kaymore and just absolutely nuke the Stalox's health. Orcris working on Divine Beast Vavridania, the beginning of which is dark, which is kind of cool from a visual standpoint. He's got visual cues to know exactly where he needs to send these arrow shots and um, is also doing some things to set up the later parts of the dungeon, like unlocking a cube that was um, behind some. I think a uh, leaves or a wooden plank that needed to be burned or something like that. There's a really cool strat there where he uses the duplex bow, which fires two arrows, one in front of the other. The first arrow hit the guardian scout in the eye to kill it. And the second arrow lit the, um, the blue flame torch to open the gate behind him. So one arrow shot that does two things. And the lights will turn on here once he activates the, uh, once he gets the map loaded to his Sheikah Slate. I'm curious to see how Tapir uh, does the movement, and he must go in the, uh, the so-called Copium Gate entrance. Yeah. Since the castle so. is loaded now. Yeah, it looks like it. Instead of torturing himself with an ESC through the wall. Yeah, while this the guardians be, are trying to blast you to bits, this this uh, entrance makes a lot more sense to do. Um, now yeah. he also has the Hillian shield, so he does not have to worry about shield durability at all for the rest of the uh, the run, which is actually really nice. 
Um, you don't have to worry about it if you have to parry something on Calamity or during um, the Blights at all. Orcrista here is working on a, a bit of a trick shot where you bank a lit arrow off of the top of the Divine Beast and try to hit a torch that is out of sight. It can be a little bit finicky. Nailed it and first try. Got it there. Oh, he had, he had, uh, had to run back a couple of times. Uh, so how much but that happens. We can happens. still say first try. It's always first, still try, first try. It's still, still that's true. Yeah. It's it's yeah. It's still first try. It counts as first try. <laughs> Um, so I believe Tapir does do the three Ancient Arrow route. There are two variations of the current any percent route. There's three Ancient Arrow and six Ancient Arrow. Uh, six Ancient Arrow is the route Nat was doing, which is a little bit easier for beginner runners. Um, mainly just because Calamity is a little bit easier and, uh, the movement itself is a little bit easier. Um, but Tapir, being the gamer that he is, is going for the three Ancient Arrow route where, uh, we'll start varying, um, right after he cooks this food. Yeah, you're going to see a, another scope clip, kind of like in Shrine of Resurrection, and then um, getting out of bounds and doing a mid-air wind bomb, and just kind of wandering around underneath Hyrule Castle. He'll wind up at the same endpoint, which is Zelda's study, but just taking a very different path to get there. Nice mid-air. That mid-air is a little bit... Uh sketchy sometimes if you don't get enough height or if you get too much height uh it's an issue because there are there's actually invisible water all around hyrule castle's interior after you go out of bounds um so you need to be careful with that but that was a beautiful segment right there uh he's gonna use the bomb to surprise the moblin get behind him to sneak strike it's not why giving him the not, prompt yeah why so, did they not give him the prompt i don't know that was weird but we just used the uh the boomerang to kill him real quick uh, the boomerang is the only weapon we don't actually care about the durability because after Thunderblight, we don't need it anymore at all. Grabbing an extra arrow there, I presume for safety. Usually, any percent runs don't don't break that pot to grab the arrow. And Orcrist uh, obliterating Fireblight Ganon here again. Great Eagle Bow, Ancient Arrows um, allows us to take care of these blights without too much difficulty. Ooh, and it looks like Tapir's going for the Korox setup for this skip. This is a new uh, setup for Windblight skip that was discovered by Korox. Um, it's much faster. Uh, and it's actually not too difficult. Um, you just run up against that pillar, aim at the bird statue, and then jump to the right once, and then aim at pretty much the same spot that you would aim at with the other setups for Windblight uh, skip, and it just works. What in the world? I don't know how wind or uh, how Fireblight wound up down off the boss arena, but that yeah, that was <laughs> weird. Okay, game, gotta love this game. Super good. Game's having a normal one today. It always pains me a little bit to see, even though I've done it myself many times, running right by the heart container without grabbing it. It just seems wrong to me. Yep, because heart containers are slow. They are slow. And I timed it once. I don't know it was if like, I could it's do like it. seven or ten <laughs> seconds or something like that to pick up the heart container. Well, you have to remember that Orcus has essentially unlimited fairies, so health this is, is true. not an issue. <laughs> it is not this something is he cares about. So this is where Orcus route is going to differ from the typical. I mean, usually now you'd initiate a BLSS and go straight to Hyrule Castle and just melt Calamity and be done. Um, or Calamity and the Dark Beast. Um, but because we met the incentive, he's going to be taking a detour to um, the Lost Woods or Korok Forest to grab the Master Sword. Um, we mentioned Ooh. earlier that he's going to use a stupid, easy, simple glitch that literally anybody could do. Um, it is... Oh no, what happened to Tapir? Unfortunately, to Tapir, yeah, he didn't get, he wasn't able to get the oh, second stun no. off, and uh, Fireblight uh, did his attack faster uh, than normal and one shot him. So he will be starting back over pain. at the beginning of Blights, um, which is actually going to put this race very close. It's going to be real close. I, that's insane. <laughs> I got a lag stop on a normal wind bomb. Oh my gosh. Yeah, no. Yeah, Castle is extremely volatile with how much lag it gives you. Um, yeah. 
and getting lag stopped is really really crappy because it you're taking a full damage of heart from full heart of damage from the wind bomb itself and then you could potentially take fall damage if you don't catch it in time uh, which is unfortunately what happened there um looks like though orcus was fast enough to make it through the void out barrier of the lost mm -hmm. woods and uh, is now going to go do the dumbest trick in the world to pick up the master sword so he's basically it's it's this simple i'm not i'm not joking it, he's going to drop a bundle of wood next to the master sword he's going to light it on fire he's going to angle his his uh camera up towards the sky and sleep at the campfire and when the game reloads um he will be able there's like a it's not even that tight of a window if you just mash the pick up button the a button um, you'll pick up the uh, Master Sword. That is so cool. Ta -da. I didn't know that. <laughs> I'm learning so much today. It has something to do with uh, the game temporarily kind of forgetting where you are or unloading the coordinates or unloading the triggers or something like that. Like, it's very, very silly. Um, and uh, it's very, very convenient for early Master Sword speedruns. Getting the Master Sword early used to be much, much more arduous. It was it was actually fun for a little bit. You had to do these really cool <laughs> BTB setups. Uh, but now you just do it BLSS into... Like, you just get the Paraglider, BLSS straight to the Lost Woods, and then, boom, you're in. You just do that, and you got it. So, uh, kind of took the fun out of that category. <laughs> TT prefers the challenge. I, I, yeah. like, I, I just want them to look cool. That's really it. I just want speedruns to look cool. And the BTVs definitely look cool. Yeah. Um, Orchester, looks, are we going for a Calamity skip here? Yeah, he's going for Calamity skip. He's looking, he's, he's sending it. This must be for swag, uh, because I'm I pretty don't... sure that just fighting him is actually slightly faster, but it's definitely super cool to one-shot the, uh, the big boss. I don't know if that one worked. It didn't look like it did. We'll see. But uh, the same way we did Windblight Skip, uh, because all dungeons does go ahead and kill all four of the other Divine Beasts, uh, we just fight Calamity directly. So Orchrist oh, uh, so could just go ahead and uh, smack the crap out of uh, Calamity, but he's just going to shoot yeah. him in the face a bunch of times with Ancient Arrows. Yeah, it doesn't really, I mean, it takes a little time to set up that it doesn't really hurt you to go for it and miss it. Mm -hmm. He's also got a few charges of Verbosa's Fury he can use to disable Calamity's shield. And if he really needed to use the Master Sword, he sure could, but he doesn't even need to do it. Getting a flurry rush in there for funsies. Gotta do it. Gotta flex on him. It would seem silly to get the Master Sword and then to not use it at all. And that was Calamity for Orchrist. So he is now uh, onto Dark Beast, the last section of the run. The Peer has a... I was noticing in his quick menu that he's got a modifier on, I think is. Royal Guards Claymore. It looked like a critical hit or something. I don't know yeah, if that makes any difference or not. I think it's a critical hit. It might actually cause an issue uh, oh, no. during Calamity. It might. Um, because critical damage deals more damage and uh, the way that Calamity stands up is based on how much damage he takes. So the critical hits during the part where he is going to be uh, spin attacking uh, might make him stand up earlier. But we'll find out. So Tapir is going to go ahead and just start again firing away uh, bomb arrows. At Clamity's face. Really nice headshot. He's going nice to he's gonna parry this laser. Boop. He's going to go with that Royal Guard's Claymore, turn around, get a couple double hits on him. It looks like it's fine. He's going to take it. He's going to throw it at it now. Right in the face. And then Ancient Arrow, directly to the face. He's going to do huge chunks of damage, followed up by two more bomb arrows. Next book. And this should force Calamity into a pattern where he will give Tapir an instant laser. Let's see. There it is. And now Tapir can parry this laser and just go right into the stun lock. 
yeah, this new, the, the weapon routing and arrow routing with Newcastle, um, if you execute properly, essentially ins ensures um, that Calamity shouldn't go to the wall and should give instant laser as long as you're fast enough. We're just trying to go for some sniper shots here. What's going on? <laughs> He's showing out a little bit. Textbook, textbook uh, stun lock. There we go. I got all my words messed up there. Um, I understand that too well. Textbook stun lock, and he is now off to the Dark Beast Ganons. Um, and you'll see here that he has six seconds left on his attack up timer, so like just perfectly timed out. Yeah, it's it's the boss rush is very uh, very very uh, tight timing on everything. Um, but to peer, like I mentioned earlier, is Probably has probably one of the best Dark Beast segments out of the entire community, I think. Um, he is insanely good at free firing uh, the target shots. So that just means he shoots the at where the target's going to be before the target's even there during the cutscene and manages to just nail it um, as we get there. Looks like Parker's Parker's defeating the horse. It's going to give Jeff a little treat. Good boy, Jeff. Good boy, Jeff. He's going to ravioli's gale up to uh, <laughs> cement his victory in the race. GG or so GG, Zorkrist. GG. Yeah, Orcrist had a very, very nice, um, after a little bit of scuffling on Plateau, had a really nice rest of the run, really. All of his Divine Beasts went pretty well. All the movement went great. Um, so he executed that very, very cleanly. Yeah, that was after the little bit of issues that he was having on Great Plateau. Like he, that was a very, very good run overall. Mm -hmm. This would actually be a, a, a very respectable time. That'd be like a one thirty, what, a one thirty seven, something like that. Um, the reason that it's not the 139 is because uh, in Breath of the Wild, we do not start the timer on new game. We start the timer when we gain control of a link. So uh, it's usually about mm -hmm. a minute and 30, minute 45 uh, difference between a uh, marathon run and the actual timer. Yeah. Up here, getting that belly pre fire very nicely. I just, believe he uses cues in the music to know exactly when to shoot the arrows. Yep. That is uh, how he do being it. Um, yeah, and then Tapir is on the last arrow shot, and time will be in as soon as that arrow hits that eyeball. And GG's. Time. GG's, everybody. GG's, nice job to all the runners. Woo. Wonderful job. GG. Excellent, excellent. As we watch uh, the Dark Beast Ganon fall, can we give, first of all, a shout out to all of our runners for doing an incredible job and uh, having an amazingly close race, but also, oh my gosh, where can everyone find all of you if they want to see more? <laughs> Uh, I, I can't give out my personal address. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. That that's very fair. Uh, how about on on the internet? Like not your IP address. Oh. We don't need that. But oh. <laughs> right, internet exists. Yes. yes. Uh, twitchtv orchrist underscore gc. I believe is what it is. <clears throat> and also on the Twitters and the YouTubes. Neat, neat. And are any percent runners? If if y'all are are willing to share such personal information. <laughs> sure. I don't mind sharing my address. Um, okay. <laughs> Y'all can yeah. come over for cookies. To like, come on. Yeah, let's go. Come on. I'll bring milk. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I'm found at twitch.tv slash environat. Um, and also say, or I think it's enviro.nat on Twitter and then environat on YouTube. So, yeah. Um, you can find me at TT underscore FPV on Twitch uh, and some variation of that name on every other social media platform. Uh, you can find me at, yeah, SR Tapir on everything for me. 
on Twitch and YouTube and Twitter. So, thank you, everyone. Yeah, GG, guys. Yeah, thank you all around, and also thank you to our commentators for uh, providing illuminating commentary on all of that and and helping us understand the physics of Breath of the Wild. Um, very well done, everyone. You can also find our commentator at Newborn Insulted on Twitch.tv. He does Hundo of this game, so I would recommend following him as well. <laughs> thank you, TT. <laughs> As we wrap up here, we will be moving on next to a quick break from the Zelda, but not a break from the amazing speedruns, because next up we have Luigi's Mansion being run by the one, the only Mini Mini. But while we get that set up, reminder to everyone to first of all, stay hydrated, take care of yourselves, and also to uh, keep donating to our lovely cause. It really, makes all of our days so thank you so much to everyone who's donated so far and to everyone for helping us keep this lovely event going <laughs> <laughs>